Okay, I can see that uh, the uh, numbers have stabilized, shall we say. So uh, welcome, everybody. Um, this is Paul Sims, as I say once again. Um, I'm the chairman at IFA Pharma, and I'm really pleased that you guys could uh, join us to, um, to this webinar, Patient Preferred Trials. Um, it's, it's a very interesting topic. Obviously, it's a very vital topic. Um, I suppose we were motivated uh, when, when choosing this to go beyond the topic of simply involving patients in trials. That's obviously something we've been talking about for some time. It's obviously something that's vital, but we have an ambition to try and move the conversation forward slightly, move the ambition level of people running trials forward slightly, and obviously to achieve more by saying patient preferred trials. This is, this is really a, a subtle change in language but it is uh, designed to illustrate that the patient is very much in the driving seat. It's a patient choice. It's a patient uh, preference. Uh, and, and just as we would treat a, a consumer in the you know, uh, retail world or, or, or other worlds, um, it's up to us to actually um, provide something that is valued and uh, a, a good experience uh, for those patients. And we're going to explore some ideas of how we can uh, indeed, uh, make sure that happens. So, you know, uh, we know, we know that the answer to a trial is not simply making it scientifically rigorous, that is obviously vital, uh, but it's also making it compatible with the patient's lifestyle, making it a balance, which today doesn't have to mean a trade-off, because of course we have fantastic technology, uh, we have a desire to educate, uh, and we certainly have a motivated patient population in many cases, uh, and even in those cases where we, 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 we are, we're working with patients that, that aren't motivated, uh, we have the ability to engage and find a way of working with those people. Um, so uh, we have uh, a really interesting session for you today. Now, if we go to the next slide, you'll be able to see um, some happy, smiling faces in front of you. Um, and uh, I'm really pleased by the uh, lineup that we've got today. Um, and uh, you guys are too. We've got nearly 800 people signed up for this webinar. So what we're going to try and do is make it more of an interactive session. We don't want to just make it a didactic thing. This is a, a conversation. So if you wouldn't mind looking at the right hand side of your screen, um, you should see a questions tab. And maybe if you could just type hello in there to me right now, then I can tell that you can hear me and uh, you're paying attention, haven't fallen asleep yet. That's good, that's good, getting some hellos, that's a good sign, thank you very much. So obviously now you are familiar with that box, please do use it uh, and uh, maybe even ask a question now if there's something that you want to uh, ensure is addressed over the course of the, the next hour. Uh, I am going to do something which I don't normally do and ask each of our uh, panelists to introduce themselves. So let's start top left. Kelly, say hello. Hi everyone, I'm Kelly McKee. I'm the head of patient recruitment and patient-centric initiatives at Vertex, which is a biopharmaceutical company in Boston. And um, I'm really passionate about the value that patients bring to making new medicines possible. Um, many people don't know that clinical trials and patients are the way that new medicines are uh, come to market, and um, that's one of the things that I'm really excited about talking about and the value that patients bring. Great. Thank you, Kelly. Alicia. Hi. My name is Alicia Staley. I'm the Senior Director for Patient Engagement at Metadata. Uh, Metadata provides um, clinical trial software, uh, you know, software that powers clinical trials um, across the whole spectrum of, or the whole life cycle of a clinical trial. Um, my role at Metadata is really to bring the patient voice uh, into Metadata in ways that, that they, had not, they haven't done before. Uh, it's really bringing um, new perspectives and a new focus on what it truly means to be a patient-centric company. Um, and we're really looking at ways to just improve the company from an internal perspective and how we uh, view patient input to clinical trial design. Um, in clinical trial engagement. So, thank you. Excellent. Uh, next, Erfan. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Erfan Khan. I'm a cardiologist and a principal investigator. I'm also the uh, CEO of uh, Circuit Clinical, which is a uh, integrated uh, site network in upstate New York. Um, and we've uh, built a platform, TrialScout, which is totally focused on the idea that there's 
uh, millions of Americans out there who've participated in clinical research, uh, and it's, uh, it would be interesting to hear what they had to say about it in, uh, in order to understand better what we're getting right and what the opportunities are. Great. Gretchen. Hi, my name is Gretchen Goller, and I'm the Global Head of Patient Recruitment and Retention at ICON. Um, my team works really closely with a lot of different sponsors and our study teams to come up with unique and innovative ways to bring the patient voice to everything we do. And coming from my perspective and starting out um, working with patients in my career, I'm really excited that finally sort of the industry is caught up <laughs> at putting the patient at the center of everything we do. So I'm excited to be here. Excellent. Thank you. Jane. Hi, my name is Jane Miles, and I work at Roche in clinical development. And I'm just going to keep it simple and say I'm a clinical trial innovator. And my mission every day is to find ways to make trials more patient and site centric using technology and data, but really with user experience in mind. And I'm delighted to be here to advance the conversation. Thanks. Thank you, Jane. And last but certainly not least is Lily. Hi everyone, Lily here. I am first and foremost an autoimmune disease patient advocate, and I'm also the head of client relations at Savvy Cooperative, where we're connecting healthcare companies directly with patients so that patients can share their insights and feedback and help companies as they're developing their products and services. And we do a great deal of work in the clinical trial space, helping bring patients in to review trial protocols and, and creating ideation workshops to think about the whole life cycle of a clinical trial um, and, and getting patient feedback on that. So very excited to be here with this group. Great. Okay, so the way in which we're going to work this is we're going to keep this as a fairly open end discussion. Um, we're going to try not to get too tangential. If it happens, then please, uh, audience, uh, get us back on track and uh, so <laughs> tell us to get back to the what we're supposed to be focusing on. Uh, and um, we're going to punctuate it with uh, the occasional sort of audience poll question. Uh, so we're going to have a bit of interactivity as well. Um, I actually am going to divert from from what I originally planned to do, which is to start with one of those audience poll questions. I, I actually just want to get the conversation going. I'm actually speaking to you right now from the San Francisco Bay Area, where I'm visiting a few companies here, which are obviously uh, quite uh, technology uh, focused. And uh, I've been talking to a lot of people who uh, believe that, um, well, we obviously realize that clinical trials are the most expensive part and perhaps the part of the pharmaceutical industry that needs the most reform. Uh, it's indeed responsible, I would say, for many of the higher prices that we suffer from. And obviously that causes a lot of issues at the, at the end of the cycle when patients are trying to be treated. Um, and so many companies here, of course, are focused on technology as the answer. But at the same time, many, many people say, Technology is one thing, but you have to start with the patient and you have to, uh, you know, you'll never be rid of completely of the human element in trials. And I guess I would love to just start a little conversation here of whether or not we feel that um, technology is indeed the answer to to so many of the, the patient focused problems. And, and, you know, we always say technology is not the thing you start with. But maybe in this case, technology could be some of the things we start with. Knowing our capability, knowing what is possible um, in the process of digitizing trials, making them more efficient, making them more uh, local to patients. Uh, and by local, I mean not just geographically, but, but, but obviously in people's hands, shall we say, uh, is something that technology provides. So I'd like to just kick off a little discussion here is, you know, chicken and egg. Which comes first, the patient or the technology, or really is it impossible to separate the two? Who wants to uh, who wants to answer my uh, strange hypothesis? I can start us off. It's Kelly. Um, I think that the ideal solution is really um, not one sided at all, and is going to be both high touch and high tech. Um, people are about relationships and um, and stories. And if you think about the ways that um, you, you think about the best experiences in your life, it's really, um, you tell it through story. And so if we need to, if we're going to get to a place as an industry where clinical trials are preferred and um, by patients and by sites, 
and are considered to be a choice in their treatment um, regimen, then we really need to have both a high touch and a high tech solution. We can't just keep throwing the latest and greatest novel technology um, and, and think that it's going to solve it because it's not because we're people and um, we're relationship focused and um, and clinical trials need to be part of that too. Can I chime in a little bit? This is I, I, sorry. Oh, sorry. Go, Alicia. Go. Uh, it's Gretchen. <laughs> I was just going to piggyback. <laughs> it's okay. I was just going to piggyback on what Kelly said, and and exactly that we these these solutions can't be determined in a vacuum. So if we are going to be patient focused, we have to be asking them how they want to be communicated with. We can't sit in a boardroom and say, okay, for this study, we're going to create an app and we're going to do this and we're going to do this without actually involving the patient in those decisions and asking them, how do you want to be communicated with? How do you want to be engaged with? Um, we're not experts of each individual patient and their life and what they need. So we absolutely need their involvement when we're coming up with those strategies. Sorry, Jane, go ahead. So I'm just going to come at it from the other side of this equation, and I agree with everything you've said, but just to throw a new story in, I recently had the opportunity to share some ideas and learn from a technology development company here in Silicon Valley, and the big light bulb moment for me was that those people are amazing at developing tech algorithms using math. And I actually didn't understand that patients have not typically been part of the design process for protocols. So the reason I share the story is because I think there's a way that those of us who are committed to making this happen need to navigate both sides of the equation on behalf of patients and to enable technology so that it fits the use case. Does that make sense? Jane, I love that. And, and this is Lily. I'd just like to add to that. Um, you know, I think that what technology is allowing us to do is it's allowing us to bring trials into the home and making it more convenient for patients, which is absolutely phenomenal. Um, but to both, you know, to all of your points, really, um, not losing that human touch is so critical. And I was actually chatting with an ovarian cancer patient in a clinical trial um, a couple months ago, and she, what stuck out to her the most about her trial experience was the fact that the nurse that she was working with would call her every evening while, she, while the nurse was with her kids and check in on her to see how she was doing. And that was the most meaningful part of her clinical trial experience. And so I think we really can't lose sight of um, the human touch and, and it's important to, to have that blend. Yeah, this is Alicia, I, I absolutely agree with, with what you're saying. I think what, you know, in our rush to look for um, the, the better, faster, cheaper, shiny, solution, I guess, if you will, from a tech perspective, we forget that there, there's something inherent about these uh, clinical trial interactions that, that really, really need this empathetic touch. They need that human touch um, in a way that you don't see uh, replicated or, or encouraged in other industries or, or, you know, these consumer behaviors that we look at in other industries have been very hard to replicate and um, model in the clinical trial relationship. And I, I think we have to really focus on the concept of technology with empathy, uh, because if we, if we don't do that, we lose the opportunity for that, that human touch, the human connection, and, and that's really fundamental at the core of anything that's occurring in a clinical trial. You know, Alicia, if I could uh, follow on to that, uh, and and it sort of um, echoes what, what Kelly and Lily were just talking about as well, is, is if technology is going to be meaningful to a clinical trial patient, I think it has to speak to that. I, I think there, is, there are good examples of uh, a product that actually does help people get feel more connected and stay more connected. I think Airbnb is probably a nice aspirational uh, model for that. I, I, and I think that that whatever is going to service the the industry to provide solutions uh, should focus on the fact that uh, that patients have a lot to say anytime they're asked. Um, but typically speaking, um, that information is not shared routinely with other patients in terms of what they're saying. I think that, so. There's a couple of gaps I think in here 
uh, when we think about technology and, and clinical research uh, that that are that are really open spots and 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 really create the opportunity to say, okay, well, how do we help them feel more connected um, to the the project, essentially the the uh, the endeavor that they're all on collectively uh, with us, and uh, and then secondly, is there a way in in creating that opportunity to uh, to uh, enhance the experience? And, and so I think I think empathy is absolutely top of list if anyone's thinking about technology in clinical trials, uh, you know, it seems to be that it's the bottom of the list and it really, it really should be seen as, as the way forward. Let me play devil's advocate. Thank you, Ifan. Uh, this is Paul again. Um, technology is introduced into systems because it provides efficiencies as the usually the first driver. It's a cost uh, oriented activity. Um, but you've all said that we need to somehow um, combine uh, technology with empathy, we need to have high touch uh, type of uh, situation. Airbnb um, is a website, it's a sophisticated website, and it provides a lot of transparency. Um, but unless you actually pick up the phone or write a message in, it's not a personalized experience as such, it's not a human experience as such. I uh, find it difficult, I've got to be honest with you, to reconcile this. I find it difficult to understand how um, you know, we've got uh, obviously websites like Facebook, which have uh, combined personality and technology. And perhaps, you know, we know that Facebook star has fallen a little, uh, and perhaps that's because they allowed the technology to, to overtake and, 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 uh, and didn't uh, have, the, have the patients uh, or, the, or the person's um, uh, interests at heart. Um, you know, is this, is this genuinely realistic that we're going to be able to do this? Is there actually a solution out there? We've been searching for quite some time that actually combines this uh, ability to really capture the individual needs and the huge myriad and variety of individual patient needs that there are, that, you know, technology scrambles to actually comprehend and, and service. Uh, I have to be honest with you, I sit on the fence with this. Well, this is Alicia. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to jump in because... Um, I think that the point that you make is um, important, and I, I think that, but using um, Airbnb, I guess, is, is an analogy, or even any consumer-facing uh, website where you have what we would consider these seamless interactions, um, you know, when you're engaging with Airbnb, you're looking for a place to stay. That, that's sort of an age-old kind of consumer um, transaction. Um, clinical trials, there's not enough about the clinical trial experience that a patient can draw on um, to, to put themselves in into a mindset of understanding what that process is all about. Um, so I, I think when we're comparing, you know, are we, you know, I, the, the analogy that I, I see repeated all the time is, you know, clinical trials should be just like buying shoes on the internet or <laughs> buying any product on Amazon. Um, we understand the fundamental consumer behaviors when we're buying a product that we need or we want. Um, when we enter into a clinical transaction or a clinical trial transaction from a patient perspective, there's so many unknowns that, that um, it's very hard to look at um, standard business models and standard consumer transaction models as, <laughs> Um, as a comparison for this kind of interaction. So, so my challenge to the panel is we need to have courage to start looking at different business models and different patient interaction models to truly uh, bring technology to, to the full bear uh, on this industry. And I, I don't, I think that when we um, look for existing models to base our, our decisions on, we're doing ourselves and patients an extreme disservice. Um, and we have to start thinking about it very, very differently because the tools are there. Um, we just have to start looking uh, for different models of application and different ways to bring technology into these interactions that do allow for this empathetic touch because it's possible. We know it's possible. We see it, uh, you know, in very, in very small pilots um, here and there, but, you know, we have to really challenge ourselves to, to bring, bring this to scale in ways that have never been done before. The tools are there. It's just, can we push through and develop a model that truly works for us in this? Yeah, and Alicia, Alicia. just building on that, I really think that in allowing patients to have a choice in their clinical trial experience can get us to a much better place, if not all the way to the finish line, but certainly improve the experience. So, you, and we can utilize technology to help us there, right? So, um, 
allowing patients to have a choice if they want to have some of their visits done by home health or through telemedicine, or if they would rather um, use an ePro or a paper diary. Not everybody has to have the same exact experience in a clinical trial for us to be able to answer the scientific question at hand. So if you think about, um, you know, introducing choice in every single area of our, li our lives, it's been shown that, um, that there's um, better satisfaction. So, you know, maybe as an industry, we can just start there and agree that not every single participant in a trial has to um, go to the study site for every visit or has to fill out the um, same type of form. It can be the same form in, in a different, um, you know, delivery method, if you will. Kelly, it's Kelly, I, I totally agree, and I'm cutting someone off, but here's where I see our role, let's say collectively in this teleconference webinar. I think we need to be the pioneering navigators here that help find the balance between rigor and congruity of data, because we want to make sure that our results are strong and will support the scientific needs, while enabling that it for purpose choice. And so Paul, when you were talking about Airbnb and the lack of a customized interface, I actually had a real strong visceral reaction because I don't think this is a one size fits all equation. It's a fit for purpose, individual choice decision that has to fit within the requirements of conducting rigorous clinical trials. That's why it's tricky. And that's why I guess I posed the question because technology is is uh, a form of standardization in a way because you know we're trying to template interfaces, find efficiencies, and that's kind of the whole the whole point of it. So that, that's why that's why yes, perhaps that reaction is there. Uh, you know, you can react from the side of a, a business person who's like, well, we need to make this as efficient as possible. And you can react from the side of a patient who's like, well, this needs to be as tailored as possible, uh, and reconciling and, those two. Um, Easy. Sorry, I, yeah. I know we want to move to the next question, but this is Gretchen. I just want to make one point about the elephant in the room a little bit. Um, and I agree with Kelly and Jane and Alicia's points about the answer to the Airbnb question. But I think what we're also failing to realize is that we're way behind any other product that's out there in the marketplace, right? So, you know, Airbnb has the benefit of people knowing what vacations are <laughs> and knowing what, you know, you're looking for, right? I know that I want to take a week in August and go to Italy, say. Um, I'm not, but just hypothetically. Um, but I think our, our main issue to start with is building that foundation with getting the information out about what we do and using technology for that purpose too. We should really be finding a way to educate people about clinical trials and clinical research and the importance of being a participant and being a patient in our studies first. I mean, we're, we're kind of starting behind the the eight ball in terms of our audience, right? There's, there's people seeking information, but they're, they're really not sure what they're seeking for. So I would just like to throw a curveball out there and say, I first and foremost want to use technology to set the stage and educate people about our world. Um, because then they're a better informed consumer and they're a better informed person. And then they're really in, even more engaged than not knowing what they didn't know before they found us. Okay, great. So, uh, guys, if I sorry. could, I, Paul, could I uh, just uh, okay, add okay. one thought to this? Just, yeah, yeah. Cause the, the, this began with the idea of what is the business case really for, and, and, and it is true that efficiency is, is one, of the, one of the primary uh, roles that technology serves. Um, but I, I think the business case for technology to create better connectivity, to do exactly what Gretchen said, to educate, I, I truly believe that's going to be peer to peer. I think that as much as patients listen to doctors, they would much rather hear from other patients. Um, and I think that the business case really aims at um, a better patient experience is very likely to impact retention. If nothing else, it's likely to, to change the milieu for how people think about choosing clinical trials, right? Which goes right to, um, it, it's really about story. That we, we began with Kelly talking about the importance of story. I think if we can get people to understand that this isn't an era of, you know, Tuskegee and those kinds of legacy issues, you'd get a different kind of patient at the table um, and I do think that the business case for it is less on efficiency and more on another bottom line uh, factor, which is once a patient enters a trial, how good is the journey and how, how engaged can we keep them? So I, th I think there's some opportunities there. 
Okay, uh, sorry to interrupt the conversation. I'm just very aware that time is ticking fast. Uh, I've got some questions um, from the audience about um, recordings and things like that. So yes, this, this webinar is being recorded. You'll be able to uh, listen back, you'll be able to share it with colleagues. Uh, we'll send it to you afterwards. You don't need to ask me for it. Uh, it will be sent to you um, probably by the end of the week uh, by, by, by email uh, to you. Um, and um, lots of people asking, are the slides gonna change? Um, so yes, we do have a few slides uh, up our sleeves and we'll come to them and uh, each of the uh, panelists uh, has a couple of um, slides uh, that they may may share with the, with you in the conversation coming. Um, and uh, people asking if we're going to see some examples and best practices as well. Um, maybe there isn't best practice in existence yet. I think that's the uh, perhaps the conclusion from the conversation so far. Um, but yes, I'm sure that the uh, panelists will share some some examples and things. Um, what I'd really like you guys to do right now is to open your questions box once again, uh, and I'd like you all, uh, everyone listening, to actually write in the answer to this question for me. And unfortunately, we're not going to be able to see the answers live. But what I'm going to do is offline after the after the webinar, I'm going to put this together in some kind of word cloud or priority order to see uh, what the majority answers are. Um, but it has to kind of be a free text answer. So my question is, what is the greatest barrier towards creating patient preferred trials? Patient preferred trials obviously being the title of today's webinar. What is the greatest barrier towards creating patient preferred trials? And if you can all just write in a short sentence um, uh, with your answer to that, uh, I'm going to force you to choose only one barrier, the greatest barrier. Notice how I'm uh, describing that in a singular way. Uh, and then if you can, uh, uh, I can see some people have already uh, writing in, so that's great. Um, and uh, we will uh, uh, consolidate those answers. As I said, we've got a good audience on this webinar, so it's going to be really useful information if everybody can answer that question. What is the greatest barrier towards creating patient preferred trials? Uh, in the meantime, whilst you uh, think about uh, that, um, what I'd uh, love to do is to um, uh, address uh, another uh, question that, that, that is obviously at the top of everybody's uh, lips. In fact, you know what? I'm going to address a question which Nick Hicks has written in. Uh, Nick, Nick has actually challenged the very notion of this uh, the title of our webinar here, Patient Preferred Trials, is that really the most suitable description? By definition, you're in a trial because you're ill, you just want to get well, uh, even better have the di original diagnosis as a mistake and not having to bother about the trial at all. Um, is it almost giving the patient a sense of too much choice, I think is what Nick is uh, challenging me on here. So um, I just want to speak to that for a moment. Is it about giving the patients a sense of choice and ability to, to select uh, that they're going on a trial and which trial that they go on and giving them that sense of a shared experience, a shared voyage of discovery um, uh, to, to determine uh, what the best treatment solution is? So who's so got a comment Paul, on that? Paul, yeah. patients always have a choice. That's what informed consent's always about. Mm -hmm. So I'm not really sure where the question's coming from that patients shouldn't have a choice, right? So patients, GCP, ICH, right? They always have a choice. But what we can do as an industry is make them um, want to participate in clinical trials, allow them to make an informed choice to participate in clinical trials, and not as a last resort, and not and more of a first resort. I would love to be in a situation where when patients are having, um, you know, conversation with their friends and their family and their physicians that they are thinking about clinical trials as a choice the same way that they're thinking about should I go on standard of care, should I, you know, not um, receive any treatment, should I wait and see, should I be in a clinical trial, all of these different options. So I think that we've got options throughout our lives and clinical trials should be one of them. And then we can absolutely, you know, bring that into the experience of what do I want my experience to look like that we just spoke about. Exactly, a clinical care option. I'm echoing uh, Kelly's sentiment 100%. And that speaks to our, our need to set that foundation again and educate people and get a better baseline for what they know about clinical research and look at it as a clinical care option and not just when I'm very sick you know, this is what I've got to do. Cool. Okay. Thank and maybe you. Maybe the broader question. Oh, yeah. yeah. Go for it, Ethan. Yeah, I was going to say, and, and maybe the broader question of um, of 
you know, the nomenclature of patient preferred, you know, I, I think it's an aspirational idea, right? Which is that if we if we want to move to a trial to trials that better fit what patients are experiencing um, and and will be experiencing, um, the only way that's going to happen is if we if we help them understand, you know, what options could theoretically be possible. We talked earlier about digital isn't for everybody. The the digital transmission of information isn't the best source for some people uh, for a variety of uh, you know, physical and psychological reasons. Maybe it's paper in some situations. And, and so being able to kind of figure out what it is uh, that uh, that where customization is possible uh, without uh, eliminating scale, that, that's really important. And, and so I think that does, that That to me is, is how I think about the phrase patient preferred trials. It's, it's how do we create this path towards things that are likelier to engage the patient, which again is a bottom line issue because it's likely to keep the person in the trial. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you, Ifan. Um, thank you to those of you who've written in with your answers. Uh, I've got about a hundred of them in front of me, so too many to read out. I have to say, though, that I've never seen such a diverse list in my life. Um, there is certainly uh, <laughs> a multitude of different things and uh, uh, really everything from regulation to education to lack of awareness to uh, pay, uh, recruitment to, to, you know, different, different uh, uh, aspects, interesting ones, you know, in South Africa, our greatest barrier is poverty uh, and some interesting comments. So um, keep those coming in. Um, but I'm going to throw a question up in front of you. So if you look at your screen right now, um, this will apply for everyone except for the panelists. You will see a screen in front of you. Do you believe that it's feasible and realistic to give patients a sense of a shared discovery experience in a clinical trial? And this conversation, this this uh, question is going to frustrate you because you'll probably want to give a uh, a more detailed answer than what I can give you in a multiple choice question. But I'm deliberately forcing you to choose any one of these just to give us a snapshot. So yes, it's feasible and realistic. It's feasible but not realistic. It's neither feasible nor realistic. Um, so uh, I think there probably should have been a fourth choice in there, realistic but not feasible. Although, you know, I guess that's the same thing. Right, um, <laughs> I will hold that open for three more seconds. I can see we've got about 50% of people voted so far. So cast your votes, please. Three, two, one. Okay, let's have a look at the replies here. Okay, so this is the, uh, so just over half believe that uh, indeed it is possible. And of course, there's going to be nuances, different diseases, different geographies, different uh, patient situations uh, that will uh, never provide a, a cold cut answer to that. Um, but there is a sense of positivity there, I think, from that, that quick poll, um, uh, a sense that uh, something can indeed be achieved. Uh, sorry, I'll put that back on the screen. Any, um, any comments on that from the panel? Actually, I was going to make a quick comment because people might at least I, on my screen, I can see this image of a map. Can anyone else see that or is that just me? Uh, whilst trying to click the buttons at my end, um, but uh, keep talking, keep talking. Okay, so actually, Josh, could you show the picture slide that sort of shows the landscape of where patients can help us and how we can help them. I don't know, I don't have your deck. Slide two or three maybe? Yes, this one. So this is an image I didn't create and all of the credit has to go to Tuft and DIA. This is an output of the first phase of their study to try and quantify both the adoption and the impact of patient engagement practices. It was conducted in 2016. I won't go into a lot of it, but I think that this image is really telling. You don't need to be able to read every word. But as they conducted the study, they had this big aha that to create that real shared experience, this is a continuum. This is not about calling somebody up and asking their opinion about a trial and whether or not the inclusion exclusion criteria are okay. This is actually a discipline practice that fits along the life cycle of development and commercialization with a two-way exchange of ideas. And the picture tries to represent that. You'll get it in the slide deck. But I'd invite Lily to add her thoughts and Alicia as patients about whether or not this even hits the mark on experience and what you would look for. 
Yeah, you know, Jane, thanks for pulling this up. I think this is a really incredible landscape and example of the ways that we can be engaging patients throughout the life cycle. And so, and, and we've talked about this before that we often see people just think, oh, I'll bring patients in for the protocol and that's it, it's a one and done. But it's really not a one and done. There are so many different places that we can engage patients along the life cycle that's actually not only going to help patients feel involved, but it's going to result in, in um, you know, a positive business outcome for the company. And, and I say this, and even talking about after protocol development, get patients involved in the recruitment strategy. Patients know their communities best. They know where patients are. They know what support groups they're at. They know where they, where, where they live. You need to be working with patients on the recruitment strategy. You need to be working with them up to approval, post-market, all of this. I mean, it, it really does, it covers everything. But I, I love this because it's just not a one and done. Patient engagement is no longer a one and done. It's great if you're bringing patients in for a protocol, but it's not enough. Yeah, I think, you know, um, I'll give you an example from my own personal perspective. So uh, this is Alicia. I'm, I'm actually a three-time cancer survivor. I've done a lot of work with um, the patient groups at the hospital that, that has basically followed my cancer care for the last 25 years. Um, and when I was first put on the patient advisory council, you know, they, they kept asking questions like, how do we improve the patient experience or, or what should we be looking at in the life cycle of a patient that com comes to, a, you know, a, an interaction at our hospital? And they wanted to really try to improve what it, it, it meant for a patient or, you know, can we improve what their waiting room experience was? And I said, it doesn't start in the waiting room. It starts when the, the patient gets in their car um, and, and starts to drive to the hospital uh, for the first time, or it's the, the patient that gets on the subway um, and, you know, starts their journey to the hospital. And I think that, you know, we're, we, we look at, at certain interactions or very discrete transactions within the clinical trial life cycle and think if we can just dig in on um, making this one piece of the, this equation a little bit better, it will just improve the overall experience. But I think we have to just remember, we have to step back and, and um, you know, walk a mile in the patient's shoes kind of analogy where you're gonna to start to see things that you didn't think of. So including patients in protocol design is uh, an excellent step. And you know, it's, can you help can you get patients involved in actually designing the software for the solutions that, that you're going to work with? Can you get patients to um, share what their their day-to-day -day experience is when they're in a clinical trial? And I think we'll start to see areas where we can um, look at the, the system as a whole uh, and improve it from that perspective. And we have to keep that in mind that um, this is a continuum and we have to look at the whole continuum in order to improve the whole process. No, Alicia, something you said just, just brought up an analogy for me that um, I'd just like to share. I don't, and I know we've talked about, you know, the consumer um, angle versus clinical trials, um, but I don't think that Nike, Adidas would ever put a shoe out without trying it on somebody first, right? Exactly. So why are we designing, implementing, and executing trials without trying them out first? Great analogy, There Kelly. is a little bit of work yeah. going on with trial simulation, but it's not, to my knowledge, it's not an industry standard. Yeah, exactly. Oh, not. Yeah, and we do it, and it's, it's easy to implement. So if people are thinking, oh, it's so hard to get these, you know, patient-centric innovations approved and done. Yeah, it's not. It's really not. You just have to do it. Yeah, and I think there's, there's something to be said about, um, you know, clinical trial simulation from the patient perspective, but I think the eye-opening moment for me in the work that I did with the, the hospital and the, the patient family advisory council at the hospital was when I had the, um, the, the, the executive board members basically um, walk with me throughout the entire hospital so I could point out different aspects of what was going on um, at, at the hospital or just give them a perspective that I had. Um, 
think we just looks like I got disconnected there for a second, or is somebody somebody's playing um, music or something? I I know it was very it was very soothing. <laughs> like I bring my own mouth yeah, band or what? <laughs> yeah, it was up tempo. Yeah, you did. Uh, it was your background music, Alicia. Oh jeez. <laughs> I had no idea you had that. That's very. Really cool. <laughs> and, and that's personal branding at a different level. I mean, yeah, <laughs> yes, um, absolutely, absolutely. That's strange. I don't know. <laughs> can you guys? If I could hijack this for a second and ask yeah, Alicia and Lily a question, um, I, I'm curious to know if you think that um, that uh, you know we we all kind of know what these sort of uh, these these choice biases are when it comes for a person looking at a clinical trial option in the room. That's where I spent a lot of my time of talking to patients, you know, uh, thinking about clinical uh, research options. And um, and it you know you can surface a lot of ideas people have about clinical trials from what they've heard or what their what their primary care doctor has said or what their friends have said about it. And uh, I'd be curious uh, to 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 know if you believe that that the path forward there is patients educating other patients. Oh, I d definitely. Um, I think that that the the concept of the patient mentor or the the patient the patient to patient interactions is is um, overlooked and um, and I can I say this from personal experience uh, going on almost 30 years of my cancer survivorship journey if I had <laughs> if I had a dollar for every conversation that I had in a waiting room at a hospital or at a, a clinic site um, where I picked up a tip or got some great information from just uh, sitting there chatting with other patients in the waiting room, um, like that's just uh, the the insights that patients can share with each other. Um, that's an untapped untapped potential, I think, for making significant changes and improvements in the overall uh, patient journey. And I don't think that we do enough to uh, formalize that or encourage it in, in a way uh, that makes sense for the industry. Um, and I think it's a shame because there's a lot of value in these conversations that patients have um, and, and just a lot of insights that help us improve each other's experience. Um, and I think that that's really what drives uh, a lot of people's advocacy efforts, um, that, that they, they've seen these interactions, they've been the patient to sort of walk the walk and, and feel this. Um, and it's just, uh, there, we have to do better at, at capturing these insights that patients have um, to improve their individual experiences. Alicia, I love Thank that. You. I don't want oh, to okay. leave that. I think you've done an amazing job explaining that. Um, one thing I, I wanted to circle back on um, that I wanted to add, but the music interrupted, um, was, and I think this is a really good example and tends to stick in people's minds. So I like to share this story. When we think about patient preferred trials, and I really loved, Alicia, how you were talking about that we need to be thinking about the entire experience from the time they get in the car to the time they go home. Um, and, you know, we had, I, I, when I was working at Clara Health, a company connecting patients to clinical trials, we were working with with a rare, on a rare disease trial. And we had a patient call us at midnight and say, oh my gosh, um, you know, honestly, like, is there any way that you could order me some food? I feel so bad, but like, I'm just so hungry and I need to eat before we go in. But the food they're giving us at the trial site, it tastes what I imagine prison food would taste like. Um, and so it was just this like really jarring experience for us. And, and she told us, you know, I really think that this medicine seems like it's great, but honestly, like if I really didn't need the medicine, I'd probably drop the trial because of how bad the food is. I mean, so just thinking, it drills down to even that level. And so thinking about all of the different aspects of that patient's journey and when you can, doing trial simulations at each site, which I understand is tough to scale, um, but but trying to think through all of those different elements. So I just, I wanted to, to throw that story out there because I think it's it's a good one that sticks in people's minds when they go to um, sit down and, and actually start to think about the patient's experience. And just, thanks Lily, just a quick plug for sites. Trial simulations help sites as well, not just patients, because I think 
And a lot of times um, when we're writing protocols, we're not thinking about all the logistics, just not just for the patient, but for what the site has to perform. So doing a trial simulation with a site involved as well shows a tremendous, shines a light on, on how doable or not that particular protocol is from a site perspective. Couldn't agree more, Gretchen. This is Jane. Um, again, I'm going to talk about an idea that I didn't create, but boy, did I learn from it. Um, and just to clarify, in my mind, you don't need to do a trial simulation at every site, but to Gretchen's point and Lily's point, it's really helpful if you do at least a couple in your iteration to get the input of patients and sites. So we created what we called an Imaginarium, and it became a design thinking event. Um, again, not my idea. I just got to witness and learn from the experience. And to Alicia's point, I think some of the biggest ahas were actually in the clinical research team because they literally had no idea of the impact and the burden that they were asking of both patients and sites. Did they get to change everything? No. But now they had a different lens to make the decisions on what was essential and what could actually shift to be more patient and site friendly. Hello, everybody. This is Paul. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, Paul. Yeah, okay, sorry. Um, I, as moderator, uh, just to show you how uh, fallible technology can be, I've actually missed the last 10 minutes of conversation as uh, unfortunately I got kicked out of the system. This is probably my 100th webinar and that's the first time that's happened. So uh, as moderator, it's always great when you have no idea what everyone's talking about. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I uh, can I um, interject by, by asking an audience question and if and sorry I think I, I interrupted you there but please feel free to um, carry on just after I launch this open. I just want to um, go on to perhaps the important topic of making this actually happen within um, the pharmaceutical industry and I've got a bit of a I guess a slightly uh, focused question here uh, about whether or not um, within our organizations within pharma companies we have or hope to have in-house centralized group. Um, we need to have uh, a, a home of expertise here um, within companies to actually provide this uh, kind of uh, provide this guidance. Uh, so what do you currently have? Um, and obviously I'm interested in pharma company people ask, answering this question. If you don't work for a pharma company, please consider your clients or your uh, colleagues in pharma uh, and give your answer here. Uh, I can see that we've got, we've only got about a third of people voted, so please do vote. Uh, yes, fully developed. We're working towards this, but haven't achieved it yet. We've thought about it, but decided not to use that setup. This isn't something we've considered. So I'll hold that open another three seconds, if that's okay. Three, two, one. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I see we had a flurry of last minute votes in there. And then here are the results. Uh, so there is desire to do this, um, but there is also a significant minority of people who haven't considered it. Um, and I don't know what the reasons are, please feel free to write in into the questions box and give us a bit more color behind your answer um, and tell us uh, why indeed you did that. So I apologize if that question kind of diverted from the previous conversation a little bit. Uh, that's what happens when you aren't part of the conversation. Um, but uh, if, and I don't know, um, I cut you off. So is there anything that you wanted to just say from the previous question, or did you want to comment on this? Uh, no, actually, I'll, uh, I'll take a stab at this, because I think it's interesting. I think it's interesting. What jumps out here to me is, is, is where you ended, that, that one in five, uh, um, it isn't even something we've considered yet. So um, when I listen to you know, the people who really would know how to create change inside an organization, you know, um, you know Gretchen, uh, Jane, uh, Kelly, and, uh, and um, Alicia, I, it, it surprises me that, that, that uh, you know, it, it's just another reminder that we've got a ways to go um, because without those champions inside large organizations, it just doesn't, uh, you know, it's not going to happen uh, spontaneously. And it's, it's probably not something that can be uh, driven from the outside and it's going to take people who have specific knowledge of these places uh, to make it happen. So that, that is interesting. Cool. Any other comments? So I'd be interested to hear from the 7% who've thought about it but decided not to pursue. 
Yeah. Mm. If that was you, perhaps you can write in and give us an answer. I'll read it out. Uh, you know, what was the barrier there towards you doing that? I actually have a little bit of a follow-up question. I might just go straight to it now. Um, and uh, hopefully you can now see a different question in front of you. Were you to have such a resource, which type of support would, would be most valuable? So um, what, what, uh, what do you think uh, of these three options is, is critical? Uh, is it guidance at high level around strategy and, and uh, almost what we should be doing? Uh, is it sharing of best practices across therapeutic areas? So how? I guess that would be. Is it internal education about the value of patient preferred trials? That's supposed to say, clearly got cut off. Um, that's kind of, you know, why, I guess. Um, so is it what, how, or why that is the uh, most valuable thing that you would appreciate? I'll hold that open another three seconds. We've got clearly the alert third of you who voted already. Um, so I shall hold it open three, two, one. Let's have a look at those results. Thank you, everyone who voted. And here we see a clear winner. Um, it's sharing of best practices. It's seeing examples, uh, showing us reality as to how and what can be done. But I wouldn't say it's uh, the other options are are minimal either. Uh, so so actually, it's this. We need it all. <laughs> we need it all, right? So I mean, I'd be interested uh, to hear from the panel, particularly those who uh, work at pharma companies. Do you uh, encourage this kind of activity? Do you think there's a, uh, a, a benefit to centralizing some of this stuff or perhaps that sort of takes some of the democratic uh, nature of it away? Um, I'd love to hear the sort of pros and cons and, and what do you feel, feel is most valuable? So- oh, Jane, that? I'd like to take a hard yeah. shift to the right here just for a sec because mm. we only have about seven minutes left and I could expound on internal, external and centralization. My interest here is to add to this sharing of best practices and mm -hmm. to share a personal experience as um, a participant in a virtual clinical trial. Mm -hmm. And I'm not advocating as a member of the company who's sponsoring it, just literally as a subject, it's my learn by doing. But the learn by doing has been so beneficial to me as someone who is trying to drive this way of thinking and acting because it made it real and tangible. And now as someone who's been in the trial, I have clear examples of what's possible and what makes a difference. It's not theoretical, it exists, but it takes a real disciplined and thoughtful approach to integrating that user experience into the rigor of the trial setting. I could go on and on, but I heard somebody say, is this even possible? And my answer is, it is, it exists. It's not common yet, I think it will be. Thank you, thank you. Any further comments on that? I can show the results of either of those polls again if you need to see them. Silence. I've Killed the conversation somehow. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe the, it was the previous me. conversations. So, so, yeah. <laughs> as someone who has worked on this within sponsor organizations, um, I'm going to advocate for what Kelly and Gretchen have been talking about from within sponsor organizations. It's really important to create that sense of purpose. This is not just about technology, this is to help the patients who are in our trials have a better experience so we can develop medicines faster. Hmm. And it takes a balance of driving for efficiency while of enabling freedom in the structure of a rigorous data collection experiment. So if you're thinking about trying to do this and you're a little stuck, I will raise my hand and say, I'm happy to help anyone just in a conversation. Like, find me on LinkedIn, we can chat. <laughs> me too, and, and Ellie, happy to help anyone. And this, yeah. this is Alicia. Um, I think the, the, the point from the patient perspective and all this is, it, if you encourage or if you extend your hand to a patient and, and 
with the expectation that, that this is something that you're going to do collaboratively, that, that you're going to walk with the patient through this entire journey. I think you'll have patients respond to that, that kind of outreach and perspective in a way that, that you haven't seen before. So if patients understand how vested everyone is in this process um, and understands that, you know, this whole industry is there um, really to provide support and help. Um, you, this might seem so simplistic and so counterintuitive, but um, in a critical situation that a patient is facing in a healthcare crisis or uh, trying to work through the, the decision-making process that they have to go through when considering a clinical trial, it, just the simple fact of reinforcing your willingness to support them um, be with them and walk with them goes a long way. And I think that sometimes we forget these these soft skills or these um, you know these kinds of interactions and how much value they provide for patients. So um, you know we can look at this from every angle: the, the technology, the relationships, um, the compassion, the empathy. And when it comes right down to it, if a patient knows that there's somebody there looking out for them, willing to support them. Um, it drives the whole process. Alicia, it's Lily. I just wanted to echo that. Um, and I pulled up a quote from a survey that we ran at Savvy on the patient perspective on pharma. And we had a nice quote from a chronic illness patient who said, the people who rely on your products want to work with you. We want a dialogue. We want transparency. We are the experts on living with our conditions, we are an asset to you. Um, so there are a lot of patients out there who are eager and who are excited to work with companies to help um, you know, make the clinical trial experience better and make products and services better. And so um, you know, I, I encourage you to reach out and, and to work with them because they have a, a lot of value to bring to the table. Okay, uh, we are fast running out of time, just a couple of minutes left. Um, I'd like to just uh, finish with um, the recommendation for a next step for, from each of you. And if you're gonna have to keep this fairly concise, each of you, um, but I'd like to, to just round up with, if there's one thing that people should be doing after this webinar, or maybe one thing that you feel, feel that you have picked up from the conversation at this webinar that is gonna uh, become an action item for you, uh, going beyond this then then what is it so maybe we can go one by one and just hear your uh, final thoughts so um, let's do it in the reverse order from which you introduced yourself so should we start with you Lily Sure. Yeah. Um, so I think that I'm going to just keep it brief and, and what I just shared with my quote, I mean, that's really my action item is reach mm -hmm. out to patients, work with them and, you know, please feel free to get in touch if you need support trying to make the case for bringing patients into the fold, because I know it can be difficult and we didn't really touch on ROI today and, and the value of doing that, but I'm happy to have conversations with anyone to help you craft your, your proposal um, when you bring it to decision makers. Great, thank you. Jane? I'd say be brave. And don't forget that this is a human interaction. Uh, it's not just technology. And I'll again iterate on my first statement. If you need help, please feel free to reach out. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Thank you to both of you. Thank you to everyone for being so open. Uh, Gretchen, action item. I would say advocate, advocate, advocate. And whatever idea that people told you was crazy um, or that you thought, there's no way that they'll let me do this, push so hard this year that you do that one, even if it's one thing, do that one thing that they told you that you couldn't do. I'm sorry, I'm sounding like Jane, but I'm echoing the brave sentiment. I think too many times we get caught up in people saying, no, we can't do that, we can't do that. Push, advocate. And even if you just get that one thing done this year, you'll see how quickly it unfolds to other pieces. Once people realize that, yes, you could in fact do that one thing that everyone told you you couldn't do, um, that it'll, it, it's a domino effect and it leads to a whole host of other things to really truly walk the talk of having the patient be at the center of everything we do. Thank you, Effin. Yeah, I guess I'd close by saying that I, I think that uh, we're at this uh, inflection point. I think that the patient's voice 
is absolutely about to be amplified in a variety of ways, a variety of platforms. Uh, but there's enough interest out there to hear what patients have to say, let them talk to each other about specifically about clinical trials, uh, that I think it's going to facilitate and make it easier to sort of bring this into the uh, into the organizations and say, yeah, we definitely need to account for this because um, it, that conversation is happening anyway, and we should be a part of it. So I, I would encourage uh, anyone who's interested in, in, um, in creating organizational change to take a look at what's out there uh, already in terms of uh, patients uh, seeking tools and, and using tools to kind of uh, have their say on the clinical trial process. Thank you, Ethan. Alicia. Sure. I think um, my my challenge to everybody on the on the call and in the audience today would be um, very similar to what Jane and Gretchen said was this concept of you know be bold, be courageous, um, don't be afraid to to really um, try to move things forward, um, act with a sense of urgency, um, because I think that. Uh, the patient communities uh, work from this position of urgency every day. Um, and, and we can never forget that the industry business model um, really is uh, a patient, patient's life uh, represents, can represent life and death uh, to a patient. So, you know, we have to be very good at, at balancing the business aspects of this with um, the, the human interaction. And that's extraordinarily difficult, but it's doable. Um, and we can get to a point where we're much more empathetic in, in the way that we lead our businesses. Great. And Kelly, who I have to give a special thanks to because uh, Kelly was uh, a driving force behind making this webinar happen in the first place. Uh, so thank you for that, Kelly. But uh, your final thought. I'm going to have a call, put a call to action out there for everybody to showcase the work that you're doing to make um, clinical trials an option for more individuals and to make them a better experience for the, our participants who are fundamental to bringing new medicines to market that we so desperately need. So my challenge to all of you is within the next week and a half, to tweet or link in um, something that you've personally done to drive the mission forward. And let's share our successes and um, get us all to a better place within the industry because we can do it. Great, so uh, I like that one. It's obviously uh, amplifying and making a sense of normality there, Kelly. So um, really appreciate that. And uh, obviously we know we know who you are. <laughs> we know who's on this webinar. So I'll be watching uh, and, and seeing whether or not you can share something there. Thank you for that, everybody. Um, obviously huge, huge thanks to everyone who's contributed today. Some really interesting conversation. I can see we've still got a lot of people engaged on the call even now. Uh, and uh, clearly uh, many, many questions, some of which we didn't uh, have time to address. Uh, many answers to my, my uh, question about where the barriers are earlier. So we've got some work to do behind the scenes to maybe answer a couple more of those questions and to provide you with uh, a bit of a, a breakdown of, of, of where the, the thoughts on that question were. Um, if you'd like to um, carry on a uh, conversation, you'll see that we have a couple of events coming up, one for people in Europe, one for people in North America. Um, you will meet some of the people. Uh, I hope that, uh, you've, you've heard on this webinar, as well as uh, the smiling faces that you also see in front of you. All of these, of course, involve a lot of patients, both of these events, uh, and all of them actually do have for the first time a strong focus on clinical as well. It's not just the commercial side of the business that we'll be focusing on. So it would be great to see you in person at one of those events. Please do get in touch if you'd like to be there. Um, once again, huge thanks to everybody. Uh, any final thoughts, just write them in. I'm gonna hold the webinar open for a couple of minutes after I finish talking. Um, I would love to maybe just hear your uh, incredible uh, thank yous to the panel uh, from yourself. So feel free to write in and, and thank anybody, um, but also to share uh, any suggestions you have for future topics, things that we didn't address, things that you'd love to see covered, uh, any, any other suggestions. I'd really appreciate that. Um, guys, great job. Um, really enjoyed the conversation today. I hope it met your expectations and I hope you will learn something as well. Uh, and no doubt see you all sometime soon. Thanks everybody and have a great day.